I'd like to welcome you all today to the World on Fire Environmental Justice Now. Um, I was telling my husband this morning, this has been my, my dream of putting this together for a couple of years. And I'm just so grateful uh, for the for my colleagues and new friends for doing such a beautiful, expressive job and flowering far beyond what I could have thought of. I'd like to start today by honoring the First Nation people in whose land we are. This is Nisinan territory, Maidu, Miwok, Yakuts, Pomo, tribes coming through this area. I also want to honor the non-human relations that seem to be so forgotten in the discussions of climate change. The trees, the tree people, the birds, the animals that we share our planet with are suffering from the fires, they're suffering from the air pollution, they're suffering as much as the people that we share our planet with. I'd like to welcome you all today. We have a pretty wonderful group of people. Um, before I introduce them, though, I would like to thank uh, Manuel Barajas, Heidi Sarabia, Sarabia Herman Barajona, and the other organizers who helped make this uh, event happen. And Chris J is one of the sponsors, Latinos Unidos Sacramento Services, not Campaign, a national call for moral revival, Sacramento Regional Coalition to End the Homelessness, Sacramento Area Black Caucus, and the Environmental Studies Department. So thank you very much for being here today. Um, we have four speakers uh, lined up that I'm just really excited, and I, I think you will be too, to hear what they have to say. Each speaker will have approximately 15 minutes, and then there'll be time at the end. You can um, put your questions in the chat, and we'll field them. I would like to ask that you have your microphone off, and I believe if you have your camera off, it gives us a little more bandwidth um, on, our, on the internet. Uh, we will answer questions at the end of presentations, and with that, we have four speakers today, which to me are a very nice blend of power and vision and expertise. And as I introduce the speakers, I'd like to tell you why this is so important to me. I worked for two years at Imperial Valley College in the Imperial Valley, and all of my students, or 99%, were Mexican-American or Mexican. And in particular, um, I taught evening classes because the many women and mothers were coming back to school. Many of them were community activists for air quality, and many of them uh, were becoming nurses. In the Imperial Valley at the time I worked there from 2005 to 2007, 70% of the children under 14 were hospitalized for asthma. 70% of the families were taking their children who could not breathe to the hospital. So it touched me really deeply. I love the people I worked with. They were my community. And I've wanted to do this ever since then as an act of service. And you can imagine what it's like to, to have this idea and then have uh, the, the colleagues and Chris J and our speakers who can carry, it, carry the torch so, so much farther than I could imagine. So the speakers this afternoon are Herman Barajona, United Latinos, Todd Sachs, who's with the Air Resources Control Board, and he's a lecturer with environmental studies, Chris Brown with the Climate Change Coalition, and Naila Pope Harden, Climate Plans Policy Advocate. So each speaker will have 15 minutes, and we'll start with Herman Barajona, United Latinos. Thank you, Michelle. Uh, it's an honor to be here. Thank you for, to all the members of Chris J, and, and of course to our audience who has been uh, 
very uh, engaged today. Uh, uh, it's, a, um, it, it's a real honor. Uh, my name is Herman Barahona. I am the lead organizer for a local nonprofit here in Sacramento Valley called United Latinos. We have taken on the task of addressing environmental justice issues that are, uh, and you probably hear this a lot, that are affecting the poor and marginalized, but for us it's really a matter of life and death. And this is why we, are, we have taken on some really interesting partners who are willing to work with us and push for a movement that's gonna begin to make a difference in our systems that are supposed to be serving uh, everybody in this community. And um, I look forward to the conversation today. So I invite everybody here to take a look at our United Latinos website, unitedlatinos.org. We started about 12 years ago here in the Sacramento Valley as a voter registration and civic engagement group. And over the years, uh, the many members of the Latino community have uh, joined this group to, to discuss all the different social justice issues that are affecting the almost 400,000 Latinos that live in Sacramento County. One of the things that we started with a couple of years ago that really caught our attention on, on environmental justice was that we were learning that Latinos who are in Medi-Cal, and these are very low-income families who are earning less than $2,000 a month and use Medi-Cal as their insurance to go to the local hospitals, the local federally qualified clinics. Both the, the patients and the hospitals and clinics were telling us that the majority of the folks that are going to the ER are suffering from chronic respiratory conditions, asthma, cancer, heart disease, high blood pressure. And now, while we know that there are many factors that uh, create the situations, one of the coincidences, and I'll call it a coincidence, I'm not a scientist, I'm not an expert in environmental justice or climate change, but what I am is a person that works with communities to hear their stories. And the coincidence that we kept finding across our house meetings, our church meetings, our community networks, is that Latinos who were visiting these ERs or these community clinics were coming out of the very same neighborhoods that the state of California declares as an environmental justice zone. And what that means is that these are the most polluted areas when it comes to water and air. And these levels of contamination have an aggregate effect where families are affected from the fetus to the time that they, they, uh, they get old and die. This is an entire generational and entire lifespan of poisons that people are breathing and drinking. And of course, it shortens lifespan and it creates all kinds of havoc in families. And the more and more we met with families, it's funny when you go into a big room and you would ask at a church, how many of you know somebody who has asthma? More than half of the group in that big room of 200 people would raise their hand and say, we do. So then we began to meet with uh, environmental justice experts in town. Uh, I remember when I first met with Katie Valenzuela a couple of years ago, Chris Brown, Naila Popardin, and we were getting a sense of, of how serious this issue is. Uh, so with the conversation of different community leaders who have been here historically uh, for the last uh, 40, 50 years, they decided to focus our efforts in, with United Latinos to fight this issue. Because here are one of, some of the things that we found just on the surface of this conversation. I won't go into the technical stuff, but let me just show you this map real quick. And by the way, you're welcome to uh, visit our website. We have all kinds of useful links to how to register to vote, uh, what your ballot means, uh, where you can find official ballot locations. Um, but you're also gonna find a couple of uh, helpful videos uh, about where we stand uh, with our values on this issue of environmental justice. So if you see this map here on my, uh, I guess it would be on my left, on the left side of your screen, those balloons there represent all the federal air quality monitors that are installed throughout the county to uh, alert the local regulation, regulating companies, uh, agencies from the county and the state on air quality in the region. One of these coincidences, of course, is that you look at here an entire South Sacramento area, from the Vineyard, Florin, 
Franklin Corridor, everything that's pretty much South Sacramento doesn't even have one federal air quality monitor. So we began to ask questions. We went to AQMD, we went to the, uh, the State Air Resources Board to ask, why is it that South Sacramento and even some parts of North Sacramento don't have uh, these monitors in proximity to some of the biggest polluters that are in those areas? Now, just to give you some perspective on this, all these polluters in town, whether it's the pollution from freeways, cars, or industrial and commercial buildings, all of them are following the law. They have been permitted to produce certain levels of pollution in town. We have about 44 to 4,500 permits out there that, that the county AQMD uh, uh, gives to, to conduct business. The problem is that most of them are concentrated in the poorest communities of Sacramento County. So the aggregate effect of all these polluters, even though they're permitted to operate within the law, it's the aggregate pollution that stays in these areas that are having a, a very uh, fatal effect, really, on families, kids, uh, senior citizens. And of course, it took COVID-19 to just put a major emphasis on how vulnerable these communities have been because of pre-existing conditions. Our public health department here in Sacramento County uh, has shared that online that the most affected COVID-19 families are coming out of this environmental justice zone. Another coincidence. So, of course, this, besides making this very, making us this, uh, making us uh, realize how alarming this, the situation is, we began to build coalition with a number of churches, schools, uh, local foundations that are interested in working with us on resolving this issue. And it's not an easy one. It's complicated. It's about jobs, housing, but it's also about politics. And if we really are truly committed with leading with our values, one of them being equity, we know that this map already is violating all of that. And this is why we began organizing. We have a, an, an alliance with the local Catholic diocese of Sacramento, who's very invested in addressing environmental justice issues in low-income communities, the California Endowment, Sierra Health Foundation, and other nonprofits and agencies throughout town that are saying, wait a minute, why is this map like this? And what can we do to reduce uh, the se severe conditions of air, air pollution in the area? Besides asthma and other pre-existing conditions, the California Children's Trust, which is based out of the San Francisco Bay Area, is telling us that at the state level, there's been a 50% increase in adolescent uh, mental health hospitalizations. And an article recently that came out maybe about a year ago, uh, and, and uh, I think it was The Guardian, uh, was quoting some uh, scientific research has been, that's been happening around polluted neighborhoods. They also happen to have a higher level of mental health hospitalizations among uh, vulnerable families. So this, although there's no straight uh, causality proven at this point, we know that that's definitely a coincidence that we can't ignore because we know that pollution is a neurotoxin and the kinds of poisons that are being breathed in some of these neighborhoods are, could be uh, a serious reason why families are suffering from these health conditions. So if we value life, then what are we going to do? As everyday ordinary people like myself, we decided we want to organize, we want to create awareness, and we want to push for policies like the one that we're pushing right now to increase better air quality monitoring so we really know what's in the air. One thing about air monitors is that you have to understand that air monitors have to be in close proximity to polluting sources to be able to analyze or capture the, the data that's needed to analyze in what's poisoning people. And if we don't have anything there, then we don't know what's in there. Uh, so this is one of the main reasons we're organizing here today. Uh, I'm gonna pass it on to the rest of the members of this panel so they can um, make the presentation. But one of the reasons that we're here today is because we wanna create more awareness. We want to make sure that communities are, are doing something uh, positive about this to push your local elected officials and regulators to improve quality of air for the poor and marginalized in these neighborhoods. Um, 
there are all kinds of issues that we can address here today, but this is in a nutshell what United Latinos is taking on here in the Sacramento Valley. Uh, we're working in Yolo County, we're working in Placer County, and uh, one of our biggest partners right now is, um, besides the ones I mentioned earlier, is the Sacramento Tree Foundation. Because one of the things, the fastest and most effective things that we can do is capture carbon. And with that, we need trees. Well, another coincidence that we're learning is that poor areas have less trees than the wealthier areas in Sacramento County. And why that is, it's not because poor communities don't want trees, it's because the way that they're maintained or sustained are much different than the way they're maintained and sustained by government agencies in low-income communities. So these are some of the policy issues we want to fix, reverse, or get rid of altogether. So we can have an equitable uh, quality of life for even the, the, the smallest amongst us. And, that, and that's the one commitment that we have made is that you know, we cannot move forward with technological advances and, and all these wonderful things that are happening in California as the fifth largest economy in the, in the world. We would like low-income families to also enjoy the fruits of all that, all that success that's happening in the state. So I'll leave you with that, Michelle. Uh, I'm happy to answer questions or how you want to handle the, the panel at this point. I think we'll uh, save the questions to the end, and I urge you, if you have questions, uh, to put, and, and if they're for a specific speaker, put them in the chat, and we will definitely have time to get to the end. And I think all of the speakers have a little different piece of the picture. So thank you very much, Herman. Um, our next speaker is Todd Sachs. He has 25 years of experience in the environmental field and started working at the California Air Resources Board in 2000 on environmental justice issues. He's currently the Chief of CARB's Enforcement Division and a part-time lecturer in our Environmental Studies Department at Sac State. He'll tell us about what CARB is doing in the areas of environmental justice, specifically and his programs in enforcement. So thank you very much for coming today, Todd Sachs. Thank you, Michelle. Um, so I'll start off by describing a little bit about um, you know, the Air Resources Board and who we are. Um, so I've been working at the Air Resources Board for the last 20 years. And when I started, I was just coming out of graduate school. And so I've had a lot of different experiences at CARB working in a lot of different areas, but one of the areas that's been really important to me has been uh, trying to address environmental justice because the problems that have been pointed out um, in, in the discussions today with, you know, in particular with regard to Sacramento, they're not just limited to those areas, they're everywhere in the state and government really needs to do a better job in addressing these issues. Um, so the Air Resources Board is the state agency in California that's responsible for um, regulating air quality and public health at the state level. So we work very closely with local air districts, and there are 35 of them across the state. Um, we at CARB have direct authority over mobile sources, cars and trucks and diesel engines and the like. And we have authority over greenhouse gas sources coming from uh, cars and transportation, but also stationary sources like landfills and power plants and the like. Um, we also work with local air districts. Um, CARB has a review role in what the air districts do. The air districts are autonomous agencies, um, and we work with them very closely. So why do we care about, uh, you know, CARB obviously cares about air quality. Air pollution is associated with a number of different respiratory diseases, um, including premature mortality. People die from air pollution. And um, that's been proven statistically across the world and in California as well. Uh, we're concerned about photochemical smog. And for those of you who are students who are going through our environmental science classes, we talk about what photochemical smog is. And um, it's both ozone and it's particulate that you breathe into your lungs. We're also concerned with directly emitted particulate um, from everything from wildfires to individual diesel trucks. And we're concerned with toxic air contaminants, um, things like benzene from cars, um, diesel particulate matter is considered a toxic air contaminant, and then uh, pollutants like hexavalent chromium that come from 
uh, chrome plating shops, for example, that are often found in industrial communities. So there's a number of programs that the ARB um, has implemented, and they're all focused at trying to address these problems. I mean, I've listed many of them here. Um, you know, we're responsible for fuel standards and zero emission vehicle mandates and cap and trade and the low carbon fuel standards alike. Lots of just different programs that are focused on trying to reduce emissions because that's our job. And reducing emissions is, is protecting public health. But um, our policies don't necessarily do what they need to do for people who live in communities near industrial sources, near freeways, near the types of sources that the CARB regulates and that the air districts regulate. And um, what we've realized is that we're not doing enough. And so for the past 20 years, we've been trying to get our arms around the problem and trying to be better in government at listening to uh, the people who are working directly with the folks in the community who, under, who really understand these issues. Um, to try and become educated ourselves and to try and do better as government in, in addressing these issues. So, you know, what I'm showing here in this slide are just examples in the real world of what people are exposed to. People live right at the fence line of refineries. Um, sometimes refineries are, are both tanks. There are emergency events that happen. Um, people in Richmond in the Bay Area are impacted by that periodically. Um, there are the ports in Southern California and around Oakland that have profound impacts on communities. And there are trucks running up and down our freeways and vehicles running up and down our freeways um, every day. These freeways go through um, communities and that's by, um, sadly by design really. So in the early 2000s, the state started trying to get its arms around environmental justice and started looking at trying to establish policies to get government thinking about this differently. Um, there were air monitoring and air modeling studies to try to better extent, understand the extent of the problem. And there were development of screening tools to identify and try to focus resources in places where it was most needed. And at the same time, CARB went through a pretty vigorous program over the past 15 years of trying to put emissions controls on diesel vehicles because uh, the science showed us that that was where the predominant source of risk was in, in communities that we're talking about, um, like parts of South Sac um, today. So by putting diesel particulate filters on these vehicles and requiring the, the, uh, requiring the um, taking up of the newest technologies, we were able to drive down emissions and exposure and risk in communities by quite a bit. And that's really what this chart shows is that not only were we driving down risk, but we were focusing our risk reductions in um, low income communities of color, places where we needed to be focusing on. But despite that success, we're still not close to where we need to be. And what this chart shows is a picture of the screening tool that I talked about. Um, California developed a tool called Cal and Virus Screen. And what it does is it ranks different communities and census blocks and tracks based on how impacted they are by different types of pollution and what their, um, you know, what their income levels are and the like. And these communities are then highlighted and identified for government to spend more time and effort trying to clean up. Now, um, we've talked a little bit about um, earlier today, programs like AB 32 that really focus on trying to drive down emissions. And, and what Katie said this morning is that it's much, that, that whole effort is about much more than just driving down emissions. One part of, it wasn't directly a part of AB 32, but was also passed at the same time, was AB 617 or the Community Air Protection Program. What that program was about is about trying to address air quality directly in, dis in what the state of California calls disadvantaged communities, trying to find ways to address environmental injustice. And it's focused on local solution development and trying to empower communities and building better relationships between um, local governments, state governments, and uh, the communities itself. So, the idea is trying to get people to engage with government and trying to get government better at engaging with people. 
And as part of the implementation of these programs, there's all sorts of things we're doing, like trying to engage in land use, trying to develop um, better emission control programs, um, trying to focus enforcement in these communities to make sure that the sources in these communities are complying with our existing rules, and then trying to figure out what additionally needs to be done. There are a number of communities that have been selected across the state, um, and they're shown here. Um, we're focused in all of these communities, and that's just really a start because um, for all of the communities have been, that have been selected, there are many more that have not. And so what we're trying to do is build in our programs a way of addressing these issues more broadly than just 617 communities. So from my neck of the woods, I'm the chief of CARBS Enforcement Division. I'm also very um, fortunate to be able to teach a class at Stock State. Um, it's something I really enjoy. And frankly, I, I learn a lot about um, the students and, and these issues just by being a part of that. So I really appreciate the opportunity. Um, with regard to my day job working in enforcement at CARB, what we've been trying to do is bring an ethic, uh, what I've been trying to do is bring an ethic of trying to address environmental injustice into our enforcement programs. So we've worked to outreach to communities across the state. Um, we are focusing enforcement in these communities directly. We're trying to be more responsive to complaints, um, both for industrial facilities working with local air districts, as well as things like local truck idling. Um, and then we're also trying to empower communities through our Supplemental Environmental Projects Program. I will say a couple of things that I've learned through this process that are interesting. One is oftentimes the problems in communities are not problems that are, you know, people doing illegal things. It's the problem that our rules permit things to happen in communities that are at, at best a nuisance to people in communities and at worst are endangering their health. So we have a lot of work to do to be able to address the types of issues um, that are being discussed today. So with regard to our Supplemental Environmental Projects Program, what that is is um, when we're settling an enforcement case with a large company, we are allowed to divert 50% of penalties that would other go, otherwise go to the state and be able to divert those funds to community supported programs that um, we try to work with communities to design uh, to be able to address their local needs. And so um, we work with communities, develop proposals, go through a process of getting those proposals approved, and then we try to convince um, people who are subject to our enforcement actions in the process of paying penalties to solve their enforcement problem to divert funds to local communities to try to make people's lives better in these communities directly. And, as, um, and so we fund projects like um, school filtration projects or urban greening programs, um, types of things that can have a real impact in these communities. So we're trying to, to work with community groups directly to be better at um, defining and targeting those projects going forward. Um, if you want to learn more about the work that we do in enforcement, we have a website that shows all of our inspections, the location, and whether or not those inspections resulted in compliance or non-compliance. And you can go onto that website and see exactly what we've done over the past five years in every location and, and what it is we found. We also have an annual enforcement report we put out that describes all of the work we do and where we do it. So we're trying to be as transparent as possible when we talk to community groups so that if we're not paying enough attention in a particular community where it's needed, um, we will change what we're doing. Honestly, in some cases, drop everything and try to get out there. Um, to be able to address immediate problems that people and communities are experiencing. So without spending uh, too much time and monopolizing everyone's time on this, um, what I would say is the environmental injustice issues we're seeing here are in my experience substantial and they're widespread. Um, I've seen them all over the state and we're working, we're trying to understand and trying to address these concerns. We're working to try to bridge, um, build bridges with communities um, and to, we're working to try to empower communities to be able to have a stronger impact on their own air quality. But really, you know, at the end of the day, it's government's job to solve these issues. And so we want to understand, work with people, but ultimately be held accountable for doing our jobs. So um, that's what I had to say today. Thank you for the opportunity.
Thank you very much, Todd. And we'll, I'm sure we'll have questions at the end and a really time for a wonderful dialogue. So thank you for being here today. Our next speaker is Chris Brown. Chris Brown is the lead organizer in the successful city of Sacramento and Sacramento Municipal Utility District climate emergency declaration campaigns. He began his career as a civil rights organizer and over the years, he has worked in the nuclear freeze mo movement for environmental justice, rainwater and gray water harvesting and permaculture. Since 2014, Chris has been working on climate focused on building strong communities and coalition based organization. He and his family enjoy maintaining a relationship with the land they occupy with a permaculture garden. Chris, thank you very much for being here today. Thank you. And thank uh, to the organizers for uh, sponsoring this program. It's been a great program. I've really enjoyed listening to the other speakers. I'm going to talk about the connections between climate and social justice and specifically focus on one of our campaigns here in um, Sacramento County focused on SMUD uh, to give you some examples of things that you all can get involved in helping to uh, actually achieve some climate justice and some uh, environmental justice here. Um, but I'd like to start with a little story about how I connect these uh, two things in my life. Um, a lot of us were shocked, dismayed, disgusted by what happened uh, earlier this year with George Floyd and Breonna Taylor, and even more so that it continues to happen. Uh, an amazing thing about the world we live in now is that so many of these crimes against black and brown people have been caught on people's cell cameras. But I actually first woke up to uh, the injustices in our society when I was an 11-year-old boy living on the Texas border with Mexico. And a young Chicano, the same age as I, was killed by a sheriff's deputy. And the, uh, the deputy's defense was that the kid had a knife. And in fact, they ne never found a knife anywhere near the kid's body. Um, eventually, the deputy was acquitted. Um, and that was, was the time when I began to realize that I wasn't at that risk. That that risk and that poor boy's death came because of his skin color and that I was uh, in effect immune from that uh, living in Brownsville because it was a town that was run by the white businessmen um, and it didn't reflect uh, the population. 85% of the people in uh, Brownsville are of some Mexican or Chicano heritage and uh, yet the power structure back in those days was uh, dominantly white. And so I began to realize there was something different between uh, what we were being taught in school about equality and opportunity for all and, and what the reality was in the world that I was growing up in. Um, of course, that was also a time when Martin Luther King uh, Jr. was making speeches about having a dream of racial equality and um, the Vietnam War was happening. So those things affected my consciousness as well. So when I left college in the late 70s, I wanted to be a, a, a civil rights organizer. Um, and I joined uh, a group here in California uh, and worked for a couple years until Ronald Reagan, and this is something those of you who are younger, have grown up in a world and don't even realize that once upon a time, there was a, a pledge from our uh, federal government to help people who uh, were disadvantaged. And there were programs in communities uh, that offered uh, recreation, that offered extra schooling, uh, and even supported organizers like me to fight injustices. Uh, but that all came to an end with Ronald Reagan. And uh, over the years, um, as Michelle mentioned, I went through a number of different organizing jobs and ended up uh, focusing a lot on water conservation. And that's what brought me back to California uh, back in the mid aughts. Uh, and then I left my job running a statewide water conservation group to uh, focus on climate and joined up with a group, a coalition here uh, called the Sacramento Oil Trains Coalition because there was a proposal to bring 100 car long uh, volatile oil, crude oil trains through Sacramento the two major lines, train lines here, one goes through Midtown and Downtown, the other one goes uh, right down through South Sacramento uh, alongside 
14 different schools and we built a coalition and we worked with groups around the state and we, we won. We won uh, and got those uh, permits denied for those trains to come through this town. And we reorganized ourselves, uh, or actually just changed our name, <laughs> decided we would keep an AJ focus on the work we did and we call ourselves the Sacramento Climate Coalition. Two years ago, we adopted the Climate Emergency Campaign, which is an international campaign. More than 760 uh, local governments around the world have adopted a climate emergency. And they're basically saying the Paris Agreement adopted in 2015 is not enough. It's not working. We need to do more and we need to do it faster uh, when it comes to addressing the climate disasters, which I'm not going to go into great deal because we've seen them all on the news here in the last few weeks as wildfires burn across California. The, um, but what I am gonna talk about is some, two of the key elements of the climate emergency demand. One is climate justice. Um, one of the core demands of the climate emergency declarations is that the frontline and marginalized communities, which we've heard about from other speakers today, Katie uh, gave a great uh, presentation, uh, are addressed directly because they're already suffering from climate change. They're already suffering asthma, as uh, Herman uh, told us. And uh, they're already suffering from pulmonary heart disease. They're already suffering the health consequences of the warming climate. They've historically borne the brunt, as uh, uh, Todd and Herman and Katie uh, all pointed out, of where we put the worst part of our technological society, the polluting industries. Uh, they need to be at the table. You can't come up with solutions for them that don't include them in the design of those solutions. And finally, they also need to benefit first. The programs have to be designed so that they address those injustices directly. So that's part of every climate emergency declaration that we support. Uh, there's 100 uh, plus communities here in the US, 41 in California counties and cities that have adopted this. This is uh, a core demand of the climate emergency declaration. It also calls for a just transition to recognize the fact that people who work in the fossil fuel industry do so because they have to pay the bills. They're not, they, I'm sure they'd have, be fine if they had a job that wasn't polluting the planet. And we want to make sure that they, those kind of jobs are provided for with regard to job training and to make sure that the people who will be uh, those who lose jobs uh, are the first ones that have access to the new jobs in a uh, renewable energy future. This also, though, includes regenerative agriculture and ecological restoration. Part of our problem in the modern technological world that we live in is that we use monoculture farming, which uh, uses a lot of fossil fuels for, for fertilizer, and it, so it damages the soil and makes, uh, the, uh, it makes the soil less healthy, um, and it costs us because it also means that farmers are removing carbon from the soil and putting it into the atmosphere. Um, we need to change that. We know how to change that. There are re regenerative agricultural practices that can be done, and our policies need to support that, including having urban farms so that food is closer to the people who need it, who live in cities. Likewise, with ecological recovery, it's really important for the for the benefit of humans and for the animals and, and the rest of the living world, that we restore the ecology that we've destroyed over the last 270 years because we're all dependent on it. We all live in a world that's completely intertwined and interconnected. Uh, the, the health of a, a river, of the soil is connected to our health as well. And so the final demand there is provide maximum protection for all people and all species of the world. So those are a couple of the core demands that are in these climate emergency declarations. And I'm gonna switch over to talking a little bit about the one that we won at SMUD uh, this summer. <laughs> SMUD has um, five natural gas plants and um, we want those shut down by 2030. That's another part of the, the declaration focusing on getting to zero emissions by 2030 and the SMUD Board of Directors agreed to study how they would do that. 
that's an uh, incredible victory, an incredible commitment on their part, because their existing plan was to get down to uh, 80% uh, emissions by 2040, 80% uh, reduction of emissions by 2040, and now they're looking seriously at 100% by 2030. But the ones we're most focused on are represented by these three stars on this map, essentially the Campbell Soup plant, the Procter & Gamble plant, and the McClellan Peaker, because they're in disadvantaged communities. The people who live near those plants are suffering from the air pollution of those plants, as well as suffering from the carbon dioxide and other pollutants that create global warming. Um, so we'd like to see those three plants shut down first. You can see here on this uh, chart uh, that they're you know, not the most important in terms of the power production. They could be the first ones shut down. Um, the one that uh, SMUD depends on the most is the Casumnas power plant, which is down near the um, old Rancho Seco nuclear power plant. And that one uh, is actually the cleanest of their five plants. So we are really pushing hard to get them to shut down the most polluting plants and the ones in the disadvantaged communities. I do want to acknowledge the fact that SMUD is doing some great programs when it comes to sustainability. They are committed to providing financial incentives to people to switch to heat pumps, which can be both your air conditioning and your heating in the winter instead of using natural gas. They are providing uh, incentives for people to move to electric vehicles by providing charging. And they, are, they do have programs that are focused on uh, low income communities where they provide free or deeply discounted um, equipment. But we need more resources. Uh, the problem is if we wanna get there by 2030, it's not gonna be easy. Um, we need to reduce things faster and we need to replace the natural gas and other polluting uh, things that we use in our house or our cars as quickly as possible. So what SMUD's current strategy has been to front load these financial incentives for the good work and um, back load shutting down the plants. And what we're demanding is that they need to do both. And one of the things that's really important to remember about that is that the more people they get to, to get off natural gas or off of uh, fossil fuels for cars, the more people that are gonna be buying electricity. In other words, they're gonna end up with more revenue to support these uh, incentive programs. So our goal in the climate emergency, the worldwide goal of the climate emergency movement is to get to zero greenhouse gas emissions by 2030. It, it stems off the understanding that the Paris Agreement is actually gonna cause the deaths of hundreds of millions of people, tens of millions of people, over 150 million people at least uh, based on scientific projections live on islands that will be completely inundated by seawater uh, if, um, and another several hundred million people will have to move away from the coastlines of the world. Um, if we, even if we keep to warming to 1.5 degrees centigrade. So that's not enough. In 2018, uh, the International Panel on Climate Change reported that in fact, we are on track to for anywhere from three and a half to four degrees centigrade warming. So we must do more and we must do it now. And one of the things to remember and to focus on is that the same systems that benefit from social injustice in our society are the same ones that are benefiting from climate pollution. Uh, where they value wealth over health, where they value property over uh, humanity, um, and where they basically discount the impacts on the vast majority of people, especially poor people. Um, they, are, they are who we're going to be fighting for the next 10 years to turn this ship around. There's the contact information for the Sacramento Climate Coalition. And I welcome any of you to get involved with these campaigns. Thanks a bunch. Thank you very much, Chris. And once again, I encourage everyone to please put your questions in chat and it, everyone is being very, very courteous and giving us time at the end for a dialogue. And I think in the dialogue is where we'll really have some interesting problem solving. 
So thank you again, Chris. I really enjoyed your talk and enjoyed meeting you. And uh, the next speaker is Naila Popardon. Um, she's running for the election to the Sacramento, Meadow, sorry, uh, Sacramento City Unified Board of Education to represent trustee area four in California, so vote. As a new commissioner on the Mayor's Climate Commission, Naila is a community organizer in South Sacramento who focuses on environmental justice. She has over 10 years of community organizing experience, works as a statewide climate policy advocate, and is passionate about her community. Also, for us, we're very proud of her because she's a Sac State alumni. So with that, um, I'll, I'll turn it over to you, Naila. Yes, thank you. All right, so Naila Popardin, I wear many hats, as you heard. Um, I am the policy manager at an organization called Climate Plan. We um, are 50 organizations across the state that look at the intersection of transportation, air quality, housing, um, oh gosh, I should know these off the top of my head, but we make sure that the state is staying accountable to their climate goals. Um, and so we advocate at a statewide level to make sure that when we say that we want to really help disadvantaged communities that we're actually doing what we need to do. So I'm not completely wearing that hat today. The hat that I'm wearing is the community organizing hat because um, I've been organizing in South Sacramento for the last, for over 10 years um, around environmental justice. And so that's what we're going to talk about today. I think the easiest way for me to tell it is by just telling the story of my neighborhood in South Sacramento so we can get a look at what environmental justice looks like. Um, so this is the lovely definition, right, that Cal EPA, um, I mean, not Cal EPA, that the EPA has of environmental justice. And it is, for me, one of the most beautiful and affirming pieces of text that government has written. Um, I think if we take environmental out and we just have a conversation about this is what justice looks like, um, I think that would be absolutely perfect. I'm not going to read it for you guys, but um, I'll, I'll pause for a moment so folks can read it and kind of just reflect on some thoughts about it. So for me, I think the parts that really stick out the most are really in that last line, because what environmental justice means is that we're not just talking about the outcomes and making sure that our communities are safe, healthy, and people can thrive, but we're also talking about people get to be part of the decision-making process. So what really is environmental justice? And I, I so appreciate Todd for using the word environmental injustice because too often when we talk about this, we're actually talking about environmental injustices. And very rarely are we actually talking about what justice would actually look like for some of these communities. Um, and so the community that I'm gonna focus on, my community um, in South Sacramento is four miles away from Sac State, um, less than four miles away from Sac State. And um, these are folks from my neighborhood. We, this is from probably about 2010. A natural gas company wanted to come. Katie talked about this earlier. I wasn't able to come earlier, but um, Katie told me that she talked about the natural gas battle. This is my neighborhood, right? So the natural gas company wanted to pump natural gas under the, under the neighborhood. This is us. We had to rent vans, drive to San Francisco to the Public Utilities Commission and offer public testimony about um, why we don't think natural gas should be pumped under our neighborhood. To me, that feels like that should just be automatic, but apparently, uh, you know, as a community of color, we had to, and a disadvantaged community, we have to affirm that we're actually human and don't want gas pumped under our community. Um, and so, for five years, we held community rallies. We um, drove to the PUC in San Francisco, and um, we talked to our elected officials locally, and we advocated for five years. And finally, we won. The Public Utilities Commission told us that we would not have gas pumped under our neighborhood. This is a few of the representatives, some lovely folks in South Sacramento, and a few uh, lawyers and other advocates across the region that really backed us. 
And so because we what we know about disadvantaged communities is there's really not just one negative health indicator that's happening to them. There's multiple um, that are compounded all at once. While all of this is happening and while we're fighting to not have natural gas pumped in our neighborhood, it's, it's 2008 when it started to 2012. During that time, we had buses taken away from our neighborhood. So the moment we get home from San Francisco after this big win, we move into our next site, which is fighting RT to get bus service restored back to our community. And again, because us just saying like, hey, we're a disadvantaged community, a low income community, we actually need buses and buses would be really useful for us. Instead of that being enough, we had to spend three years working with our T, combing through their budgets, trying to figure out when and how we can get bus service restored to us. Um, and so same thing, right? We're, we're pretty good organizers um, in my neighborhood. We were able to get three, 200 people into a gym um, at the local community center. And we called this event Walk a Mile in Our Shoes because the nearest bus stop was over a mile away. And so um, everyone piled in. We had speakers talk. Um, we had labor leaders talk about the importance of bus service, the importance of access for communities. We also had, I would say, about half the folks in the crowd are folks um, a part of the disability rights advocacy community. And one of the issues, too, is not only is it a mile away, what, not only was the bus stop a mile away, but there also was a low tree canopy. Uh, so there's no trees along this route and the sidewalks are horrible. And so folks with wheelchairs would actually have to ride along the main street um, in order to get to the bus stop. So that was a three year battle where we're working with RT trying to figure out how we can get our bus service restored. And after three years, we got it restored. And this is our victory picture. Um, it is, um, this is actually us standing in front of Chondo's Tacos, um, the one on Power Inn and Fruit Ridge. Our neighbor, the bus run, ran right through um, the neighborhood and had a stop at Chondo's. So the bus picked us up along the route. We went to Chondo's, had a nice celebratory, um, you know, meal. So then, I mean, and while this is going on, there's even more issues being compounded and compounded. And so um, we were sitting in our community center at a neighborhood association meeting, and we're just frustrated and tired. And we thought, what's something that we can do to be proactive. We're tired of things happening to us. We're tired of systems coming in and adding these like oppressive laws and structures and pillaging us for resources, taking things out of our community. What can we do that's proactive? And so we, um, the community center in this picture would be on the right side. Um, that's that big field to the right is the community center. If you look dead center in the middle of the picture, that's a school. And, and um, in Sac City Unified, that's actually one of the most um, crowded schools per capita. So just, I mean, tons of students going to that school. And then if you look to the left, there's actually a big vacant lot um, that's just almost completely empty. And so we were looking and we said, we see this as resources. How can we, and we started small, right? We said, we just want to do a community cleanup. Um, but at the gate, as you can see, there's a lock on the gate. And we started to have conversations with folks about what it would take to just get the gates open, get bags and pickers and host a community cleanup. We can, in, we can work with the elementary school, the community centers right here. Like we just want something that makes us feel good about living in South Sac. Um, and as we started talking to folks, we realized that there was actually a ton of grant opportunities available to turn this not only into a community cleanup, but into a whole creek revitalization restoration program. So we were able to secure a few small grants so that we could do some actual community engagement. And here we are doing our first creek cleanup. We have folks that are down at the water who are starting to do water testing. Um, and let's see, here we are. We were also able to, with some of the funding, be able to go to creek tours. So we took about 40 people on a bus to visit other creeks in the region. One of the things when this project started is, um, I was told by um, one of the guys who works for the Department of Water Resources, he oversees the grant and he said, there's a grant for this, that you know we're looking for communities to apply for this grant for projects just like yours. And he said to me, um, ask me for a Porsche. I may only be able to get you a Toyota, but ask me for a Porsche, like dream big with this project. And one of the things that we found is, I mean, because we're a community that's so used and so disheartened to like stuff being taken away, 
when we started having conversations about what's possible, like, what do you guys want to see on the creek? We're like, the gates open. We just want to see it clean. We want to see, um, you can't tell, but under this bridge, we have some of our unhoused neighbors live there, right? So we want to see housing for them. We want to see a place where, they, where we don't want to displace them even further. And that's what we're talking about. And so it really took a lot for us to step outside the box and like ask for a Porsche. Um, and so one of the things we did, we led a creek tour. So we took folks, we took 40 folks from our neighborhood and um, showed them other creeks in the region and what other communities were able to do to remodel and revitalize their creeks. Okay, so we're pretty much done. So this is my little boy. Um, and so one of the things that's wild to me is when we have conversations about environmental justice and we're having conversations about some of our disadvantaged communities, we're talking about, it's often like framed like, oh, these communities don't care, they're apathetic, they don't engage, we reach out. No, in my neighborhood, the average income is $30,000, a, a little over $30,000 a year. Out of all the people who qualify to have high school diplomas, 50% of the folks do. We're tired, we're working, we're trying to survive. And in the last 10 years, 10 to 12 years, we've had to be urban planners, we've had to be environmental scientists, we've had to understand hydrological models, we've had to become transportation planners. It's not that we're apathetic, that we're not engaged, it's just that we're tired. And at some point, we want to be afforded the same luxury that other communities that are more affluent and well off are afforded. Because one thing I know for sure is folks that are in Midtown and in Land Park aren't having to advocate for bus service back, aren't having to advocate for, um, you know, natural gas to be pumped under their neighborhood. Like for them, that for those communities, that's unheard of. But for my community, every couple of years, we're having to uplift this conversation about, about our humanity and our well-being and what we deserve. And so I asked what justice looks like then, because we can talk about the injustices in my community and we can talk about the lack of tree canopy and how it needs more tree canopy and access to open spaces. And we can have conversations about illegal dumping and, and having the dumping plants. And like Chris was talking about the power plant, um, Procter & Gamble is not far from my neighbor. Like we can have those conversations, but what we really need to be talking about is what justice looks like and not just stopping injustice, but actually providing some type of justice to these communities that for so long have been at the front line of a lot of these fights. And so I think it's really important that as we're continuing to have this conversation, as we're moving forward, we shouldn't just be talking about getting folks to a baseline. We need to be talking about what's beyond that. And, um, you know, like, again, what justice actually looks like. So I use this picture of my little baby boy, uh, my little black boy. He is the sweetest, most adorable little thing, uh, the purest thing I've ever done out of all the organizing. That's the purest thing I've ever done. And as his mother, um, I'm, I'm super proud of the community work that I do. But I think uh, in 20 years, if my son says to me, mom, I want to be an organizer just like you, I'm going to be like, I, I wish I would have been able to do more to fix all the things so that you can be so many more colorful and fruitful and amazing things in the world um, besides organizing. I love organizing, don't get me wrong, but uh, I want him to be able to like be a chef or uh, play in a rock band or uh, uh, something else that, that doesn't relate to just fighting injustices. But my community doesn't have power. And so in order to do that, we need folks in power to acknowledge our humanity and ask themselves the question, what does justice look like? So. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. That was a wonderful presentation. And I invite you to uh, you in the audience to uh, ask questions in chat. I know there's several on here right now. Um, and more, I hope more coming in. Uh, Steve Roberts asks, uh, if you put solar panels on roofs, environmental justice communities while fixing their roofs, if necessary, this would go a long way to solving air quality problems and protecting environmental justice communities from gentrification. So that was more of an idea than a, a, a question. Did anyone want to comment on that? Sure. I, I think that um, <clears throat> Katie pointed out one of the problems that uh, grid alternatives has run into, which are the rules 
would say, oh, well, you know, if you need some structural improvements, there's no money in this uh, bucket of money to do that. And that's one of those structural problems that we have to fix. When we, uh, when we have the rules of the road that say, yeah, we've got some money here at SMUD to help pay for that solar uh, collector, but we're not going to pay to make sure that your roof is strong enough to hold it, you end up with no solar collector. So it's uh, really, you know, uh, a part of the structure of these programs that has to be revised and, and repaired so that we can actually achieve these goals. Uh, here's another, this is mostly, thank you, Naila, inspired every time I hear you speak. Um, Octavio asked to everyone, do you see the work you did still in effect today here in Sacramento? And I think by in effect, meaning things are sort of improving from your, your community activities. I think it's from all, for all of you. I'll, I'll hop in first and say, I think it, for, for us, it's always a moving target. I think in South Sacramento, we have such a long way to go. Um, and it, it feels a little cynical because that sometimes we can't even sit in our wins because there's the next effort that we have to have to fight. Um, and so, yes, and it never feels like enough, though. Yes, there's a bus that runs through my neighborhood. Then when COVID hit, it was, or even before COVID hit, it got taken away again because there's always funding issues that my community always varies, uh, has the burden of. So yes and, and never enough. I think that um, for, for anybody that's interested in, in contributing in this, in this kind of fight, it, you have to have the patience to build relationships within these worlds, right? Whether it's your local church, your local neighborhood association, and, and stay with it for the long run. I think that, um, you know, Hollywood has probably ruined our perception sometimes of how we win, right? It's not uh, we win one victory and there's credits behind us and it's all good and happy. That's not the way it works. It's a, it's a long-term commitment. It's a marathon. At the same time, the, there is uh, an opportunity to learn something about yourselves as you get involved. This is an opportunity for you to put yourself to the test because it will test you. And that's actually a better way to learn about how injustice is really felt by very vulnerable families. Uh, I was uh, meeting with a person who grew up in the foster care system and was moving around the Sacramento County area throughout their entire foster care life. And then they finally settled down, uh, started a family in South Sacramento. This person is telling me, I never had asthma when I was moving around as a foster care child. But as an adult, I moved into Sacramento and two years later, I'm diagnosed with asthma. And, and so this person decided, how do I join United Latinos? So what do I need to do? Because I don't want my child or my children's children to be suffering with this because I'd like South Sacramento. This is where I could afford to live. And so... It, this is a multi-generational effort, and it's got to be based in institutions. I'm a big believer in that. I happen to believe the Sac State, as well as your local parish, your local uh, schools, are time travelers. You know, they get to build the kind of institutional memory that can educate future leaders about the issues that we face. And so if we don't build power within institutions, then what happens eventually is that these these um, efforts uh, disappear in history. Now, we, we've, we've seen many of those uh, throughout uh, our history that uh, while they made some impacts, uh, they, they, they were disseminated, they, they disappeared. And so United Latinos has focused a lot on, on developing relationships with schools and churches for that very reason. How do we institutionalize a philosophy about social justice within these institutions because they have a lot of power to make change. Uh, on the issue of solar panels, for example, and roofs, the federal government gives community block grants to states and counties to decide what to do with those block grants. Block grants from HUD, from Health and Human Services, that, that's poor people's money. And the counties are the ones that decide how to use those block grants. They could easily say, we're going to start fixing people's roofs in South Sacramento. It's a decision of the county supervisors, but they don't do that. Where those block grants go every year, we have all kinds of theories and we have some, some facts that we we're gathering along the way. So we're going to need 
community power, voter power, to get organized to be able to push those policy decisions that are made at your local county supervisor, they know where the block grant money is going. And a lot of it should go to rehabilitation of people's homes. Uh, and then we can start doing all kinds of regener rege regeneration strategies, growing uh, more green areas in the cities. Uh, we could do a lot with block grant money, but we have to demand for, for it. We have to make sure we, we push yeah. for the idea, this is poor people's money. Thank you. Um, then this is kind of a follow-up um, on what you're saying, Herman, to uh, Naila. She said, I this question is, I loved your initiative to have a community cleanup. From your experience, what advice could you offer to start gaining traction and support from community members and local agencies? So it's kind of a follow-up on what Herman just said. Yeah, you know, I think that that's, there is no one answer. I think you, you poke around um, where you can get traction. Um, one of the things I want to, I, I want to point out is, is for those fights, we're talking multi-year, right? So it wasn't like we, we came up with an issue and then a year later we saw results five years, three years. Um, the Morrison Creek project has been in inception for three, four years. Um, and we haven't broken ground yet. So you really have to have, um, have a lot of patience, devotion to whatever it is you're trying to do, and, and find as many allies as you can along this fight. Um, some of the things that helped us are other folks who signed on and, and agreed with us. Um, with the gas battle, our neighborhood had been arguing and I mean, not arguing, but uplifting the fact that we didn't need natural gas. And it wasn't until we were able to talk to other neighborhoods and say, hey, you live down the street for us, from us. If we blow up, what's going to happen to you? And we had to like really build like big coalitions and have these allies with us. So build as, as big a coalitions as you can. Another question is for, for uh, all of you is, what can we at Sac State do to support you? How can we as faculty and staff, and especially students, since you're one of our alumni, how, could, how can we better be allies for, this, for your efforts? Uh, there's two sources of power in our training. Organize people or organize money. If you if you don't have the time to put it, your skin in the game, grab your debit card, your credit card, donate your car. Nonprofits, <laughs> especially the ones that fight for social justice, do not get funded well like the ones that do charitable work. The charitable work nonprofits in this town are multimillionaire agencies. Look at a nonprofit organization. I'll, I'll be very transparent by United Latinos. We've been on this project for two and a half years and we ran it on $50,000, right? So th these are the kinds of things that you need to supply resources, organize people or organize money to make them last for the long haul. And, and uh, this is the appeal that we made to the Catholic Diocese of Sacramento and they finally came through is saying, okay, we'll fund you for five years and we'll see how you do. So these are the kinds of things that you can do too as an individual. I guess one thing I would add is that there's been a lot of discussion today, even about just getting government to pay attention to what people are saying. I mean, that's just really a starting point, trying to make the government work for people. But really, and I would say this to the students, that really government needs to be of the people and you are all as students, the next generation. And so what we're looking for at the Air Resources Board in particular is trying to get, um, you know, get the next generation in and set up a situation where you can work from the inside to create change and really help us in, in building real long-term and lasting solutions to these problems. Thank you, Tom. So you want to go, Naila, or shall I jump on in here? You, you go, Chris. All right. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, right now we're focused on the county board of supervisors. Yellow County recently passed a climate emergency declaration, which, uh, you know, really called forth the impacts on farm workers. So they really took uh, environmental justice seriously over there. They have a lot of farm workers in Yellow County. It's a big ag area. But our county hasn't stepped up yet. 
the city has, uh, SMUD has done a good job, of, you know, doing a better declaration than the, than the city's was. You know, if you live in this county and, and are at Sac State and you're young, you have uh, an amazing power at your fingertips, that cell phone and using social media to talk about uh, these issues, to talk about the fact, to send messages to the county supervisors, to put it out there in your social media feeds and repeat the message that we face a climate emergency and our governments have to stand up and do something about it. They have an amazing uh, array of powers at their hands once they decide to use them. As Herman said, they have access to funds, but they also have, uh, you know, the changes that happen in this country in World War II uh, that changed our economy and unfortunately put us on the road in terms of carbon emissions that we're on right now, but it happened in four years. Private business can't change the world that way. We need the governments to step up and use the power they have to, to do good now and to get us off of fossil fuels. So use the power that you have at that little cell phone uh, and, and start expressing your opinion and send it directly to your county supervisor. Yeah, is there time for me to answer still? Okay. Um, so I went to Sac State and grew up four miles away and I probably, my first time on the campus was my orientation. We have to get out the building. Sac State needs to be in these communities. This, this is kind of hard for me to answer too because it's the way that I am wired is, um, we can't just have you guys making doing this research, learning all of this for your own good. We need it on the streets. We need it on the ground. Um, like there's so many times where we, where we have conversations about, hey, we don't think this water tastes how it should. And they say, okay, well, talk to me about how much lead and parts per million of whatever, whatever, nitrogen, hydrox, whatever, whatever. I don't speak that language. If you do, I need you to help me. Like that's, I think especially for, for, for students and we're in institutions, we really have to figure out how we make that knowledge applicable. We really have to be in the streets um, and, and just give your knowledge to the streets. If you, if you find a good study, if you are doing a good thesis, get it to the people who can use it and weaponize it. And I mean weaponize it in the best way possible. Like if you give me data, oh, I can use that as a weapon and I, and I need it. Um, so that'd be huge. Are there any other questions? Mostly what I'm seeing is how much they loved each of the speakers and um, thanking you each for being here. Um, I don't see any, uh, mainly there's just a desire by the audience to help be allies in empowering your communities. And I see that you have your contact information so people can can do outreach and help you. I have a question for Naila, which is why did you start with the creek? Why was that a community priority? And what about it was a community priority? Um, you know, we thought it was, we thought it would just be an easy, quick win. Um, we thought like when we really, our very first moment, we thought we're just gonna do a cleanup so we can get folks out into our community and it ended up like with every issue right we ended up peeling back all the different intersections um, that the creek covered so we ended up having conversations about open spaces about safe routes to school we ended up having conversations about what to do with all these vacant lots in our neighborhood but it really just started with we wanted just a project that felt good and was quick and easy and it turned out a lot more complicated. way more complicated <laughs> And where is it now? Um, How is it? So used? we did community engagement um, for three years. We just we just brought people out to the creek. We did community engagement. We were actually just awarded in January a seven hundred thousand dollar grant. Y'all get this? We were given a seven hundred thousand dollar grant, and they told me we can only do a plan with that. So for in South Sacramento, we thought seven hundred thousand dollars. We have half the creek built right there. They were like, no, we can get you guys a plan and to like the permitting process. 
So we were just awarded that money um, because of the COVID and the pandemic, everything kind of shut down, but we're planning on ramping up some community engagement and do the modeling and all of that stuff. Well, I was awarded a $350,000 grant for my work at Bushy, Bushy Lake in Arden Arcade, and it's the same thing, a restoration plan with no work yet. So I'll, I'll, I'll see if I can help you in some way. Are there any more questions or are we good for today? Well, I'd like to personally thank each of you, um, Herman, Todd, Chris, and Naila. It was wonderful to meet you. Um, and uh, do you have any final parting words that you'd like or ideas that came to you before we, before we uh, end our meeting today? Um, I, I think that the w one thing I want everybody to, to understand for me my, and my experience in organizing is the, the secret to this is building relationships. And, and it's not really the kind of relationship that's, uh, the, that's transactional, right? This is about really diving deeply about what it means to be connected as humans. Technology has really created such crazy divisions. Look at us. We're living this Orwellian nightmare through the screens and I really think organizing is more important than ever because of that. How do we build real relationships? Because if we, and, and this is a quote from Pope Francis, you know, that there is no renewal, there can be no renewal of our relationship with nature without a renewal of humanity itself. And if we don't build relationships with each other, we lose our humanity and we actually put ourselves in a more dangerous situation for the future. So. I encourage everybody to really make an effort to meet people who are different than yourselves and to really engage in the kind of reciprocity that we're losing because of this high-tech world we live in. And this is a face-to-face -face contact. That will build power. That will bring changes in the community. Beautiful. Beautifully spoken. Chris or Todd, did you want to... Add anything? Just want to encourage, uh, it's great that uh, attendance today has been so high and there are so many of the folks on the line that are students and want to learn this kind of thing. As Naila said, uh, we need you in the community. Um, it's difficult sometimes when you're a student to find time to be involved in the community, but you do bring uh, a certain level of input uh, and when you can shape your research when your classwork ties in with the needs of the community you live in, um, it's, it's invaluable. I mean, these organizations, Herman and Naila, we can't afford to hire researchers and, and do you know, big studies. So uh, having students uh, help out uh, by focusing your interest in a way that it benefits the community is a huge contribution. And use that social media power that you have. <laughs> And vote. <laughs> right. <laughs> that too. Vote on the, whatever you do, vote. Ty, did you have last words yeah. of uh, wisdom? Yeah, I guess what I would say is um, to all of you students, don't be afraid to reach out and to try to participate in government. You know, there are, there is an, an environmental justice focus in, in every state department that deals with different environmental issues. And that makes it both maybe a little more accessible and also really difficult to navigate. But um, the more you engage in the process, the government's really trying to be more um, cooperative. And I think if you try to participate, you would get a lot out of it and probably change us as well, which is important. Naila, you have the last word. Um, so I'm going to... Um, this is just where my mind is right now. I'm gonna quote Little Wayne. Um, and he says, um, he has this quote, everyone's trying to be different. Don't try and be different. Um, wait, I'm sorry, I messed up. Everyone wants to be different, um, but that makes us all the same in the end. And so I think um, 
we are all in this together, right? We all think that we have our own segmented issues that we're working on. We all think that we care about different things, but in the end, we are all in this together. So no matter how different you think you are, how, no matter how unconnect, disconnected you think you may be from the issues, that connects us all. We are all connected. So please tap in where you can and vote. I actually have some final words from a student. People forget that community shapes the environment and a lot of people are chasing faraway concepts, living fast lives and ignoring the beautiful flowers that could be cherished or creeks or trees or each other. So thank you all so much for being here. Thank you for our speakers and uh, this means so much, all of you. Thank you so much for the work you're doing to make us a better world. Sometimes when we watch politics, it gets very discouraging. And when we realize real people have real hearts and real spirits, we want to join with them because it's up to us, especially you young people are our hope for the future. So thank you all very much. Thank you very much. Gracias. <laughs>